This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening from Charleston. I'm Eric Douglas. Tonight on the legislature today, taxes and energy. But first, House Bill 4840 was introduced to the full House of Delegates today, but that introduction sparked debate. The bill significantly changes the State Office of Miners Health Safety and Training. Democrats moved to have the bill sent to a second committee, saying that the agency would no longer have inspection or enforcement powers. That motion failed. Delegate Brandon Steele, the chairman of the House Government Organization Committee, announced there would be a public hearing on the bill next week. House Bill 4007 would reduce state income taxes by 10 percent. The bill has passed the House of Delegates and is currently before the Senate Finance Committee. Earlier today, I spoke with Delegate Vernon Chris, a Republican from Wood County. He's the vice chair of the House Finance Committee. And Delegate Larry Rowe, a Democrat from Canal County and the minority vice chair of House Finance. Morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming in this morning. I really appreciate your time. We're here to talk about uh, House Bill 4007, the, the, the tax reduction bill. So, Delegate Chris, I'd like to start with you. All right, sir. Uh, explain to me what some of the benefits you see to reducing the, the income tax 10 percent. Well, first of all, uh, in all the rates, they will see a 10 percent reduction in the rates for all wage earners in the state of West Virginia. And, and that is a goal that we've, we all want is to start this path towards reducing and hopefully eliminating state income tax in the state of West Virginia. Delegate Rowe, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you have a slightly different perspective on this. So, so tell me what are some of the problems you see with, with cutting the, the state income tax 10%. Well, when you cut the tax an equal percentage across all income levels, it's very regressive. And what that means is that the folks at the bottom of the income levels get almost no tax relief at all. They get $70 for a year, whereas income uh, uh, makers and the higher levels get substantial tax cuts. Like on, on a $400,000 income, uh, the taxpayer is going to get almost $3,000 in tax cut. It's just not fair. If, they hit, if the bill had cut... Uh, only up to 100000 or up to 80000 uh, then we could have had a much larger percentage cut for everyone, which would be around 14%. And, uh, uh, and the higher income levels would not get a cut. They don't need the cut. Uh, so I, I, I have opposed the bill on that basis, that we should be more, much more generous to the low-income le level uh, taxpayer. Delegate Chris, actually, that was going to be my next question. So if you'd like to give your perspective on, on why it's not a problem. Well, we, we think that because it, it uh, attracts uh, people to come into the state because we are starting down this path that we think that uh, like Nucor Steel and the wage earners that are going to be working for them, they're going to experience uh, a immediate drop in, in state income tax uh, in their salaries, and that's going to help them be able to enjoy a better life in West Virginia uh, in, in the Mason County area. Do you see the problem that, that Delegate Rowe is talking about, that, that it is, does seem to be somewhat regressive? No, I, what I see is the fact that, that we uh, are seeing higher incomes in the state, and the ones that are making the er, that are earning the money, they ought to enjoy uh, the same percentage reduction as everybody down the line. And uh, you know, we're hoping that uh, as we uh, set aside uh, funds to cover this in the, in the transfer of from rainy day fund to a a what we call a safer fund 
that uh, we'll be able to uh, continue to drop, the, you know, the goal again is to totally eliminate it at some point. Uh, you've actually hit my next two questions with that. Uh, tell me about the, the SAFER fund. Tell me about this, this reserve fund that, that, that this bill established. Okay, well, the SAFER fund, which stands for Stabilization and Future Economic Reform Fund, is what we propose now to take the half of the excess revenues that come at the end of the year that we've been putting in rainy day fund. And after last year, we hit the over, we're over a billion dollars. In fact, I think right now we're at a billion fifty million dollars in the rainy day fund A. What we would like is to take that one half that we give to rainy day A is to put in the safer fund as a stabilization fund for the reduction in income tax. And that would be a, an ongoing affair now that we could put monies in there to, to make sure that we are able to have dollars in the unforeseen future that if we can't do another tax reduction, that we'd have funds there to be able to, for the legislature's discretion, to use at any any time at that after that. Delegate Rowe, you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> oh, I, I wish I could share the optim, optimism. Uh, we're awash in funds from the federal government right now and, and probably for the next year or so, and we hope that we will be able to have enough infrastructure improvements and coalfield community improvements that will we'll get the economy up and going and, and that we can do some more tax cuts. But again, if we're going to be fair about it, why don't we make the tax amounts the same, not the tax rates the same? And uh, the stabilization fund, uh, you know, is taking rainy day money. Uh, we, we have the rainy day fund effectively fully funded. So if, if it's going to come out, it's, it's probably all right. But, we, you know, I, I'm just concerned. I like the idea that we're signaling, attempting to signal, that we intend to reduce the taxes in West Virginia for, for everybody on an, and on an equitable basis. But I, I think this approach is just wrong. We could give everybody a 14% cut uh, on their lower levels of income if we would just cap the, the reductions at 80 or $100,000. Uh, uh, and that's per household, right? Or Yes, yes, Okay. per household. So last session there was a... Um an unsuccessful attempt, obviously, to, to – there were different bills. There was one to, to reduce the state income tax by 50 percent, another to do away with it altogether. There were several different approaches from the governor and uh, both chambers, actually. So is this something that you see for both of you? Is this something you see happening over the next several years? Is that the end goal here? is to, to reduce or eliminate uh, income tax? I, I think that's what, you know, that's the signal. But whether we can do it or not is really questionable. The governor's bill last year raised so many taxes that the House unanimously mm -hmm. uh, turned it down by putting 100 red balls on the wall. I've never seen that in my career. <laughs> but uh, uh, th there's really no sentiment to raising a lot of other taxes to cover uh, the income tax cut. The problem with that is that the income tax uh, gives us about two two billion dollars in revenue and to get rid of it is is a staggering uh, uh, sum of money so I, I think the signal is is appropriate but whether we can really achieve it or not it will take a remarkable rebound of our economy I think delegate Chris yes I I believe that uh, it is the goal uh, the approaches that we looked at last year I think the end game is what everybody wants it's just how we're going to get there uh, this year, uh, this plan is, uh, is, is drawn back from where we were last year, and it opens up for more dialogue with the Senate and, and possibly with the governor so that we can uh, set that dialogue up again and, and try to get to that game. But I think everybody is in, the, is in, the, is in it to get the goal of re reducing and eliminating personal income tax. In the last couple minutes we have left, I want to back up to a little broader picture. You know, the, the next two weeks of the session is going to be the crunch time to get the, the uh, budget, the overall budget uh, put together. Where do you see the budget going? How do you see it shaping up? And what are some of the differences between the, the majority and the minority party? Delegate Chris. Well, we're, we're working on what the governor gave us, which is a fairly, you know, fairly flat budget. Uh, he's offered uh, pay raises 
uh, on the general revenue budgets the of 5%. He, the special revenue accounts, uh, as Delegate Rowe has asked in our budget hearings, to make sure that anybody that's covered under special revenue accounts, that he's asked to make sure that they are going to get the, the pay raises also. And that's important because we're trying to help everybody that works for us. You know, there are a lot of people that don't like state government, but you know, at the end of the day, we need to provide certain services that communities can't do themselves. We need, uh, you need, we need roads taken care of. We need, uh, unfortunately, we need uh, child protective services. We need law enforcement. All these people that work for the state and have decided to take that as a career, they need to be paid properly. And, and even though we can't compete with some of our neighboring states as far as some of the levels of salary, we, we try our best with what dollars we have to work with. Delegate Rowe, you got the last 30 seconds. All right. Uh, uh, the key, this could be a historic session. If we're able to come up with the match funds to bring in federal dollars for coal community uh, redevelopment and for, for major in, uh, infrastructure improvements, I think everybody's joined together on that, and I think if we can achieve that, this will be a historic session. Fair enough. Gentlemen, thank you both. I appreciate your time. Thank and you. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. There were several bills this week focused on children and child welfare. Reporter Liz McCormick highlights two of those bills. In the House of Delegates on Wednesday, delegates considered House Bill 4344, which seeks to overhaul the state's foster care system. Perhaps the most significant component of the bill is the 15 percent pay increase to all caseworkers and other staff at the Department of Health and Human Resources who work directly with families and children to retain and attract desperately needed social workers. Delegate Jonathan Pinson, a Republican from Mason County, is a sponsor of the bill, a foster parent himself, and an advocate for improving the state's foster care system. I believe this pay raise is a step in the right direction to show these individuals, these employees who are caring for these children, 7,200 plus children, these are their help. These are the only allies that they have in the time of crisis. Pinson says the bill is not a fix-all, but will help tackle the turnover at DHHR. Pinson says according to the agency, there's a 30% vacancy at DHHR statewide and a 50% vacancy in Mason and Jackson counties. Delegate Lisa Zukoff, a Democrat from Marshall County, says she's been working closely with Pinson and others in the House for more than a year to study the foster care system in West Virginia and other states. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, we have heard horror stories. This is just the, uh, the tip of what we can do to help our system um, be better. House Bill 4344 passed the House 99 to 1. The single no vote came from Republican Delegate Marty Gearhart from Mercer County. The bill is now in the Senate Health Committee. Across the rotunda, the Senate on Thursday considered Senate Bill 463, which would establish the Best Interests of Child Protection Act of 2022. The bill would require family court judges to offer 50-50 custody to both parents at the onset of a custody dispute unless there's clear evidence of abuse or neglect from one of the parents. Supporters of the bill, like Senate Judiciary Chair Charles Thank Trump of much, Morgan Mr. County, President. say the bill will provide equal ground for both parents while also being in the best interest of the children. I'm willing to support a bill, this bill, that creates a presumption with full knowledge and understanding that our family court judges in the state are going to continue to do what they do every day around the state of West Virginia, which is try to find the answer to that question in every case. What will serve this child or these children the best? But opponents argue it's not putting the children first, but rather the parents. Senate Minority Leader Stephen Baldwin of Greenbrier County. I agree that the goal ought to be 50-50 custody, shared parenting. That's ideal. Unfortunately, when life goes wrong, life isn't ideal. It gets messy. I think we need to keep the current standard in place, best interest of the child as the, as the top standard, rather than adopt a new standard of 50-50.
Thank you. Senate Bill 463 passed 25 to 9 and is now in the House Judiciary Committee. For the Legislature Today, I'm Liz McCormick. As West Virginia adjusts to a changing energy economy, the House Energy and Manufacturing Committee has considered bills to address mine reclamation, carbon storage, and rare earth minerals. Earlier this week, Curtis Tate spoke with Delegate William Anderson, a Republican from Wood County, who is the committee chairman, and minority member Delegate Evan Hansen, a Democrat from Monongalia County. West Virginia is adjusting to changes in the nation's energy economy. Today, we welcome two members of the House Energy and Manufacturing Committee. First, its chairman, Delegate William Anderson of Wood County, and Delegate Evan Hansen of Monongalia County. Just today, the House approved HB 4491, which creates a permitting system for underground carbon storage. It passed on a vote of 90 to 10 and now goes to the Senate. You both sponsored the bill. Delegate Anderson, can you tell us why this bill is important? I believe this, uh, for one thing, this bill is very important for the, uh, the potential development of a new industry in the state, creating employment for citizens of our state. It's, I think, vitally important that we address uh, some of the uh, things occurring on our economy today. Uh, uh, varying people believe that uh, there are a certain amount of uh, car CO2 that is contributing to environmental problems, and we're going to work to uh, uh, maximize our efforts to control that if, in fact, it is the case. And uh, I believe as we do that, it will obtain potential to uh, aid our fossil fuel industries in the state. Um, Delegate Hansen, um, I guess I'd ask you the same question. Uh, why is this bill important? Because West Virginia, like the rest of the country, needs to address climate change. And um, if we're going to be burning coal and natural gas in the future, uh, we need a way to deal with the carbon dioxide that's generated. So this is going to help us uh, keep our coal industry in West Virginia in the future. Delegate Kayla Young, who couldn't join us today, she offered an amendment uh, that clarified that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it did not become part of this bill as passed. Um, uh, Delegate Hansen, why was that clarification needed? Well, I supported the amendment. I thought it was needed because that same portion of the bill uh, states that it's not a pollutant. And, and it was important to me that we weren't trying to legislate science. And, you know, the science is clear. We've known since the 1800s that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And I thought that about, that little bit of clarity would be helpful. Uh, Delegate Anderson, what about you? Well, I, I believe the, uh, the amendment obviously was defeated on a voice vote on the House floor. Uh, I, I viewed it as may, uh, primarily I had no objections to the amendment, but the majority of the House rejected it. Uh, I, I believe that it was a, a matter of... Uh, uh, just workmanship and, and how you would phrase things. Okay. Uh, Delegate Anderson, can you explain how this bill would compensate people who own the land above these carbon storage facilities? Yes, I'd be glad to. The, uh, first of all, uh, the bill declares that the owner of the surface of the land uh, will own the pore space in which the uh, sequestered carbon will be placed. Um, and it provides that uh, a mechanism where the Oil and Gas Commission can uh, uh, somewhat unitize uh, for the storage if necessary and provides that the uh, people that are unitized into it uh, would receive just and fair compensation. It also provides that anyone uh, who is a non consenter that's unitized, uh, the surface of their land cannot be bothered in any way. Um, and and I, I believe uh, uh, in the future, we may be extracting that CO2 back out of this. It declares that the owner of the surface is the owner of the pore space. And uh, we may have other uses for CO2 in 100 years. We don't know. But we wanted to clarify who actually owns the pore space so that that will eliminate that potential dispute in the future. Well, speaking of other things that are in the ground, we also have uh, HB 4025, which would exempt companies that mine rare earth minerals from the severance tax. These are the kinds of elements that can be used for batteries that power electric vehicles or batteries that store energy generated by renewable resources. Uh, the bill passed the House. It's now in the Senate. Uh, Delegate Anderson, can you tell us how this bill will benefit West Virginia? Well, I think it will benefit West Virginia. This, this new industry 
uh, th that is starting up, I believe that provides for an exemption for five years. Uh, and I was a sponsor on this bill. I think it was important to encourage the development of this industry. I was not willing to sponsor a bill that would say they would be exempt forever. If this industry thrives, then I think they have a responsibility to contribute to this state and the tax base of this state as, as we expect other business industries to do so. Delegate Hansen, what about you? I'm really excited about the possibilities of this new industry. You know, this is a technology that was developed right here in West Virginia by researchers at WVU. And it's exciting because it turns a waste product into a valuable commodity. And it's, it's a waste in acid mine drainage that right now is polluting rivers and streams in large parts of West Virginia, including in my district in downtown Morgantown. And if we could sell some of these products to generate more money to help clean them up, that's good for everybody. Another bill that's in consideration in your committee is SB1, which creates a mining mutual insurance company to ensure that the state has a backstop for its mine reclamation obligations. Senate President Craig Blair identified this as one of his top priorities this year. Uh, Delegate Anderson, can you give us an update on SB1? Well, uh, SB1 is in my committee right now. It's my intention to run the bill at some point in the future. Uh, more recently, we've been focusing on House bills. Uh, we were approaching the crossover day, the 45th day of the session, and it was my priority to get the House bills out, and then we will begin dealing with the Senate bills um, in, the, in the coming two weeks. Uh, but on the, the substance of the, the bill, uh, in terms of, of what, it, what it actually does, what are your thoughts about that? I, I think the bill is uh, for companies that are having problems of obtaining their insurance. Uh, we did this many years ago when we created the Physicians Mutual Insurance Company to, to stand up something, to uh, a company to insure, uh, provide insurance when the physicians of the state were having difficulty getting insurance. I see this as being a similar situation, um, and uh, I, I just want to ensure that uh, – uh, we have uh, the companies that are having difficulty are, are going to be able to purchase the insurance, but, but not leave the state uh, with, with uh, a, pay, a big loss. Delegate Hansen, do you have any concerns about SB1? I've got a couple serious concerns about that bill. Uh, one is that it directs the State Department of Environmental Protection to put forward $50 million to capitalize this new entity. Uh, without any idea where that money is going to come from. And the DEP doesn't just have pots of money uh, that's not set aside for specific purposes that they can just allocate for something new. Uh, and then more broadly, I, I have a policy disagreement on this. You know, the, the private bond market is more and more hesitant to issue bonds for new coal mining operations because they're riskier and riskier investments. More and more mining companies are going bankrupt and defaulting on their bonds. And I'm not sure it's the place of our government to put in place this type of a subsidy for the coal industry at this time. Uh, Delegate Anderson, do you have any similar concerns? The coal industry is important to the state. It's an important generator of severance taxes to the state. I think we have to take a serious look at this issue uh, to, to both provide some help to the coal companies relative to the insurance, but also to protect the taxpayers of this state and the, and the funds of the DEP. The financing will be the trick in this. Well, of course, there was also SB4, uh, the repeal of West Virginia's pan on nuclear power construction, uh, passed both chambers and the governor signed it. Um, Delegate Hanson, you voted no. Um, if, you, if you can, maybe in about 30 seconds or so, say what would you do, what would you do to improve it? I put forward a bill that included the nuclear ban repeal, but in a broader context that would, among other things, provide ratepayer protections, and it would allow the electric utilities to, to refinance their debt on their existing power plants at a lower interest rate to save people money. Because, you know, these nuclear power plants are being pro proposed as solutions for transforming sites that now have coal-fired power plants that might shut down in the future. So I was only willing to vote to repeal the ban in that broader context. Uh, Delegate Anderson, you supported the repeal. How do you see nuclear power, power fitting into West Virginia's energy portfolio? I see it mainly as 
the repeal of the ban adds one more tool to our toolbox in this state uh, for potential. Uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer that there are only <clears throat> two generation sources that can, at the present time, carry the base load power that is necessary, and that, that would be either coal fired power or uh, nuclear power. Uh, those are the two what I see as being the, the most uninterruptible sources of generation to maintain the grid. Uh, gas would come in into that mix, but gas can be interrupted with some disruption in the pipelines. Uh, so, so I view this as one more tool in the toolbox. I do not envision in the near future uh, the construction of nuclear power plants in this state. But, but I think it sends a positive message out to the world that West Virginia is willing to move forward uh, and, and join more the mainstream of the country in addressing our energy needs. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thank you both for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Please join us again next Friday evening for our continuing coverage of the 2022 legislative session. I'm Eric Douglas. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.